How's it going, guys? Uh, before we get started, I'd like to get a picture of the crowd. I wanted to do this in my first talk. If everyone could just wave. All right, I appreciate that. So today we're going to be talking about headless WordPress and server-side rendering with Next.js and React. Uh, I'm going to be a little upfront here. I had a live coding session uh, planned for this. A uh, couple things went awry with that. Number one, uh, I had some errors in my code and couldn't get them out. Uh, <laughs> and number two, we're actually running very short on time. So this is going to be more of an introduction to, re uh, to Next.js and React and what it can bring to you uh, and how to use it. So first of all, uh, hold on just one second. Let's see, where are my notes? Uh, dang, dang. And back. So first of all, what is server-side rendering? Uh, normally when using React, uh, your browser will download a minimal HTML page, and then from there, JavaScript will actually fill that page up with your content. Uh, with server-side rendering, the initial content is already within the, the browser, or already within the page, and uh, updates to the content are still dealt with through the browser. So what is a headless website? Sometimes called a decoupled website. Uh, with a headless website, there's a database-driven backend, which in the case of WordPress is used to maintain the content for the site and is decoupled from the front end to allow you to use the tried and true editing experience that WordPress offers, but allows you to utilize React on the front end or another view library. The content for the site is available via REST API or a very different API, up to you. Uh, the end user experience is delivered by a JavaScript application, rendering the output of the API into the built and styled front end of the website. Uh, a couple examples and variations of headless sites. Uh, so just recently at Human Made, we launched uh, the redesign of TechCrunch.com, which is entirely uh, decoupled, but it's not, um, actually isn't entirely decoupled. It's very decoupled, but it still uses WordPress theming. Essentially what we're doing is the WordPress side of things, it just renders the minimal HTML content as well as the, uh, all the scripts that are necessary to load the content and uh, everything after that is asynchronous, but it's not fully decoupled. They're not, one's not running on a node server, and then you have your PHP application on your PHP server. It is still just one application. Uh, another example at Human Made, uh, we recently uh, also launched Fairfax Media's new sites. Uh, they, Fairfax Media is the largest media corporation in Australia. Uh, their, their sites are Brisbane Times, The Age, Sydney Morning Herald, and more. Uh, and in conjunction with Fairfax Media uh, at Human Made, we created an entire custom editing experience for them to uh, maintain all their content, and then they had their own internal team that went ahead and had their own data layer on top of that that then fed their, their front end of their websites, which are all React-based. So this, is, this one is an example of a totally decoupled site where you have the React site running on a node server, and you have WordPress running on a totally different location. So what is Next.js? Next.js is a minimal framework for server rendering React applications. Uh, it was created by Zite and released in October of 2016. Uh, Zite is an organization that is stable. They're very involved inside the open source world. Uh, so Next isn't going anywhere anytime soon. It's, it's here to stay. Uh, and it's built to follow the seven principles of rip, rich app web applications written by automatician Guillermo Rausch. Those seven principles are server rendered pages are not optional. Now this is something that is a little bit opinionated, but uh, with the world that we're living in today where it's not just Googlebot that you have to worry about scraping your site, uh, there's social previews. Uh, if you paste a link into Slack, the same thing. You want these types of things to actually still be able to retrieve your content and show the user a preview of them. And without using server-side rendering, you're really missing out on a lot there. Uh, you should be able to Im act immediately on, on user input. So with JavaScript, we can essentially make it to where it looks like uh, there's no latency um, just by, create, by performing an action and then running the actual networking of that in the back end. Take, for instance, you're in Gmail. You go to archive an email and immediately 
that email flies off of your screen. Uh, really, in the back end, it's still running that operation to archive that. But as far as you, the user, are, are, is concerned, there's zero latency there. It's automatic as soon as you do it. Uh, your code should be able to react to data changes. So your UI should be self-updating. When data changes on, on one side, it should flow to your front end. Uh, you should be able to control the data exchange with the server. Uh, don't break the history. So this is something huge when you are controlling the history and not the browser itself. When you're adding things to the push state, you need to make sure that if you're hitting the back button, that it's not breaking for the user. It's not providing a, a bad experience. Uh, push code updates. So with your data also comes code updates. It, it, if you have one without the other, you're gonna get a mismatch there. So essentially what Next.js provides is hot module replacement, uh, thanks to Webpack, to be able to actually replace the modules, hot swapping them on the fly as you change in your website where you're located at. Uh, you should be able to, pre to predict the behavior of your user. And this is a little hard, but it, with Next.js, it's done with prefetching. Essentially, you can load a page, and all the links on that page, you can tell it to prefetch it, so if I'm the user and I click on any of those links, it's gonna load instantaneously because we've already prefetched all that data while I've been reading the current post that I'm on. So things to consider when you're considering to do uh, server-side rendering. Server-side rendering usually increases the performance of your app, but not always. Uh, server-side rendering helps with search engine optimization. Now, we all know that Googlebot now can uh, parse JavaScript uh, render your content in there, but it's all based on a time. It's not based on when the completion of your, your code has actually been finished. So if you have long running processes that are going to be uh, filling the content of your site, by the time Googlebot actually indexes it, it probably will only see half of that content while it's still trying to fetch the rest of it. And complexity. So obviously when you add server side rendering to your application, you're adding another layer of complexity. And this makes it to where it's harder to address bugs or implement new features because you're, you're maintaining server-side rendering. So these are just things to keep in mind. Now that's not to turn you off from it either. Uh, why should I use Next.js? So a lot of us create PHP apps, and when you're using something with PHP, you usually just start coding. You don't have to worry about uh, routing, not much at least. Um, you don't have to worry about uh, things as far as how you deploy it, you just, you just start coding and go. Um, and that's kind of what you have with Next. Uh, instead of PHP, we build the application with JavaScript and React, and here are some of the cool features that React provides. So by default, you're already server-side rendering just by serving it with, with Next.js. Um, so this will make it to where your HTTP responses are definitely gonna be longer than they were before. Uh, especially if you're under heavy load or if you have uh, a, a DOM list of thousands of nodes, um, a, a large table, uh, it's very easy for this to, to balloon out of, out, out of control a little bit. You get automatic code splitting for faster page loads. So essentially, depending on where I'm at in the site, it's only gonna be loading the modules that are actually necessary for what I'm viewing at the time. You're not loading any code that isn't needed, and this is all done automatically just by, just by throwing your stuff into Next.js. It knows what to pull in and when. Uh, simple client-side routing. So this is all based on pages. Essentially, there's a pages directory in Next.js, and within there, you put, a, you put JS files for every single one of your pages or routes, and that is how all the routing works. It's not some complex React router, and you also don't have to do routing uh, on the front end and the back end. Essentially, using the page-based routing of Next.js takes care of both sides there. Uh, Webpack-based dev environment, which supports hot module replacement. Now, I touched on this a little bit before. Uh, essentially, it adds and removes the, the modules that you're currently loading based on where you are in your site without doing a full page reload. And this significantly can speed up development process. Uh, you retain the application state uh, which is lost during a full page reload. Uh, you save valuable development time by only updating what's changed on the front end of the site. Uh, and you can tweak styles so much faster with hot module replacement. It's almost like as if you're inside the, uh, the dev tools, essentially just changing things in the browser. As soon as you save, it's automatically loading that 
but it's not doing a full page reload. It's just loading the new styles that you've saved. Um, you're able to implement with Express or any other Node.js server. So if Express isn't really your liking, there's a ton more out there, and you can use pretty much any of them. Uh, and you can customize it with your own Babel and Webpack configuration. So out of the box, it already is configured to run how it's supposed to, but if you want to tweak those, if you want to add things in, totally possible uh, and very easy to do within the next config. Uh, there's also prefetching. So pre prefetching picks up where code splitting left off. Uh, Next.js allows us to, allows all of our optimized bundles to be lazy loaded behind the scenes using prefetching. And there's actually fantastic error reporting. And I know what you're thinking, error reporting, how can it really be that fantastic? But uh, the way that the error reporting comes back to you, it's in such a readable way that it makes it a lot easier to pinpoint where the issue actually is and not a, an issue that's you know, called 10 times after that. Um, every developer knows the struggle of, of fixing something and it ended up being something trivial that you spent two or three hours on. We've all been there. Uh, and with Next.js, it really just makes it a lot easier to avoid that. So how do you get started with Next.js? Uh, pretty basic. We're going to create a directory just called Hello Next. Uh, CD into the directory. We're going to initialize an NPM package. Uh, that will just essentially create our package JSON. From there, we're going to install and save React, React DOM, and Next. And we're going to make a directory called Pages. As I said before, this is where all of our routing is going to be located at. So, so far, our tree looks like this. We have our package lock, our package Pages uh, directory, and a node modules directory. Obviously, I deleted everything that was in the node modules directory, otherwise this slide would not fit. Uh, inside your package JSON, you want to just add in a scripts uh, key here, and your dev is just going to run the command of next. Build is going to run next build, and start runs the server, the next start. Uh, to get started, you only need, like you can use Windows, Mac, uh, or Linux. All you really need is just Node.js installed. So inside your pages, uh, this is a very simple page. Obviously, we're just exporting the default, and we're just literally just saying welcome to Next.js. Um, and there's actually a bunch more in Next.js. Uh, but we are running short on time. There's 15 minutes until the, uh, the, the closing ceremonies. And I wanted to leave room, not just for questions here, which I'm, I'm sure you have a ton because I didn't go over too much, uh, but also leave room for questions on my ES6 talk as well. Uh, as I said, I had a coding session uh, to demo here, but it wasn't working, which I guess kind of shows that maybe the error messaging isn't the best, or isn't as good as I had. Uh, but that's where we are for today. Uh, so thank you. Uh, is there any questions on this talk or even my ES6 talk that I went over earlier that I, I wasn't able to get to? Where can they get slides? For the ES6 talk, I will have them up, uh, I'd say, within two hours of leaving here. Uh, this one I'll have up as well then. Uh, I will put them up on Slack, yes. Uh, I don't know if I can just export from slides to, to be PDF, or I'll just share the link to the actual slides. Um, there was also, there was a question in my ES6 talk. Uh, someone asked about um, array find and how that differs from array filter. And I was a little bit incorrect there when I had answered. Uh, after thinking it over a little bit more, array find will actually provide you with the single element. Uh, the single object that you're looking for, whereas array filter is going to provide you with an array with that item in it. So that, that's the difference there. Um, any questions? <laughs> yes? That's a very good question, especially with WordPress. It's something that has been debated. I, I've talked to Bobby about this, and Bobby's working on something right now I know of. Um, Oh, yes. Uh, how, how do you work with authentication inside of an, a headless app? Um, so there's a couple different ways to do it. And it also it brings up the question of, should you do it if, if you need authentication? Like, do you have the resources for this app to, to build that all out? Usually, if you need login, it's usually, like for a, at least a WordPress site it, on the front end, it's usually going to be for commenting or anything like that. 
Um, that's usually pretty basic, and I would, I, I would usually just say use uh, a service for that. But if you actually need like interaction on the front end, like almost like a forum or any other type of interaction on the front end where the user actually has, has to be authenticated, um, I would wait until more tools are produced for that. Because right now, it's kind of, it's kind of up in the air. Like I, I, even the creators of the REST API, hey, how do, you do, how do you do authentication on the front end where you want them to be able to authenticate? It, it's still uh, opinionated and not really locked down yet. So time will tell. <laughs> Any other questions? Well, that's easy. Um, older browsers, polyfills, like there's still things that are not, uh, that even though ES6 is implemented, um, there's still features that still need to be polyfilled. I, I believe, and maybe you could correct me, maps, weak maps, I believe those are a polyfill. Um, so it's more for the advanced features, like if you're using const and let, I would still run it through Babel, uh, just because you're gonna maintain that support at least for a little bit longer. Um, people are still using IE11, uh, you know, unfortunately. It, it, it's, it's just, it's the truth. Um, if you don't care about those users, I guess you can. <laughs> yes? Absolutely not. So essentially, uh, Babel just takes it and transpiles it into ES5 code. It doesn't do it on the fly. It'll do it in, like, uh, essentially you would have a build system. So when you're deploying your application, you would have Babel go ahead and build it, uh, and from there you're referencing only the ES5 code. It just compiles. It creates a single file. Mm -hmm. It has things like tree scoping and it's able to look at all the stuff that you're acquiring in and smartly pull stuff in and you can stuff that only pulls parts of stuff. If you're deploying an entire library, then it pulls parts of so it can actually be a very small file. Yes. yes. So is Next.js delivery a component to React, or is it something less than a component that React will call? Um, can you repeat the question? I'm sorry. So I'm, I'm trying to understand what is a Next.js delivery rendering to React when it arrives to the front end, to the browser. It delivers a fully work uh, working component, or is there a uh, fully working component with all the content already in it. Like essentially all, uh, everything that you're gonna see rendered on the front end when it renders, whether it's a React app or a Next.js app, what you're seeing there is actually what Next is going to deliver you. It's gonna be the fully built out HTML. So React will take care of maybe interactions? Absolutely. And, and so essentially when it, when it loads it to the front end, it still, have, it still has those React references to everything. So uh, say I do an interaction, like a after my page loads, I go ahead and I click on a new page. It's going to know to, to change out the main component with this new component, uh, but it's not doing a full page refresh then. Uh, so essentially once you load the page and you start interacting, it's from there, it's, it's just acting like regular React. Everything is happening on the front end, but if you were to actually fully refresh the page, or if you were to copy the link and send it to someone in Slack, it's gonna pull up the preview based on the content that's actually produced from the back end of Next.js. Great. Well, we have nine minutes until the uh, closing ceremonies. Uh, is that in, a, in another room anyway? Yeah. Perfect, then it gives CBC 155. Uh, I'll see everybody there.